Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to start off, I, I, I know of this concept of vulnerable leadership, and so I'm going to start off and be super vulnerable, and I'm going to tell you about a moment that happened in my closet this morning. I was choosing what I was going to wear today, and I, I thought of my, my 11-year-old, who's a fashionista, and she always has comments on what I'm wearing, and she calls these my party pants. And I pulled them off my closet rack because I thought, today is a day for the party pants. <laughs> it has been four years since we've been in this ballroom together for this event. Last time was 2018, when the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency was Sarah Carpenter. And I am Maura Collins, the new executive director of VHFA, new for the past four years because we had a little pandemic in the meantime. I don't know if you've heard. And since we do this conference every other year, it means it's been four years since we've been together. And I'm so excited to wear my party pants with all of you and get a chance to connect with you in real life and not just with, you know, the Zoom box. So, pop quiz, hotshot. I'm starting with an impromptu poll. We're not doing the poll clickers this time. We're going to do uh, old-fashioned raise your hand. I've had too much technology the last couple years, OK? So raise your hand. We've done this conference every other year for over 20 years. So raise your hand if you think you've been at this conference five or more times over your career. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Now, put your hands down. Now, I want to see hands for someone, everyone who has never been here before. This is your first conference. <laughs> Welcome. I don't know if you've heard, but housing is having a moment. <laughs> yeah, and so it's a hot topic. I'm, I, I take it you have heard. Um, and, and it's impacting all of us, what's happening with housing. And it has been for a long time. But I want to do another poll. Raise your hand if you are a part of a group or an organization that has helped deliver stimulus funding to Vermonters. Yeah. Yeah. And raise your hand if you or a group you work with are planning for the future of Vermont's housing and communities in light of all the changes over the last few years. Yeah. This is an amazing group of people we have gathered here today. Welcome to the Vermont Statewide Housing Conference. You are all very welcome, whether this is your first or your fifth or whatever time it is for you. Because we need all of y'all. We need all of you. Uh, this is an all hands on deck kind of situation. We need all of you here today and all of you helping to address your piece of the housing challenge that's happening in Vermont. So before I thank our sponsors and our organizers, I want to thank you, each of you, for lifting up your part. There have been times, especially in the last two and a half years, where the housing and care needs of our communities have been really overwhelming. I think a lot of us have at times felt that overwhelm and felt smothered by the enormity of what's happening around us. But in, somewhere during the pandemic, someone helped me remember the parachute game from elementary school where you know you have that slippery parachute of multi colors and it was often round and everyone grabbed their colored slice and we all would billow it. Sometimes we'd popcorn balls up in the air, but the best part was when we all threw the parachute up and held it in our hands and then whoop, sat on it real quick back when we could fall to a wooden gym floor and be able to get back up. <laughs> But the magic was what happened inside that multicolored parachute when you could see your friends across the way and there was a shelter over us and we were all protected from the overhead gym lights as we sat there under that parachute. And that is what I kept thinking about during the pandemic, that it wasn't my job to do everything 
I just had to hold on to my colored little triangle and do my part and sit my little butt down in that seat and make sure to hold up because by doing my part, I kept, kept the roof up over all of us. And it was all of us together. We have a sold out crowd today and I do think the weather may have kept a few people away, but we had over 450 people registered for today and it was together that we all had our little part of that parachute and did it. So thank you for what you have done and been through over the last several years. Thank you. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the 47 sponsoring organizations that made this conference be so affordable. They're listed in the slideshow that you've been watching and you're gonna see them uh, up again. I really wanna thank our premier sponsors of the conference, both Raymond James and the Vermont State Housing Authority. Thank those organizations because a conference of this size and caliber can't happen without their support. <clears throat> As I said before, the conference is breaking all sorts of records. Even when we had the HUD secretary years ago, we did not have as many people registered as we do for today. And so with that comes a few logistical realities. Um, it looks like we're okay with seating, but if those of you are walking in and you want to be brave enough to come find seats this way, you're welcome to. Also, some of us are a little rusty and out of practice with being around so many people. So let's take care of ourselves and each other. And please respect those of us wearing masks and understand that some of us may want a little extra space, but recognize that we're going to have to do our best to have this conference be as smooth as ever. And, um, and in with the glitches that are bound to happen, because we're all a little out of practice, um, we, there is a workshop that is not going to happen today that you may have signed up for. It's the 3 p.m. Uh, breakout session on housing discrimination. But thanks to CVOEO's Fair Housing Project, Jess Hyman, she is going to um, be in that room at the beginning of the session. She's gonna have handouts and materials if you're really interested in learning more about housing discrimination in Vermont. And she'll be there for a bit to answer some questions and connect with folks. There are other workshops happening at that time. So you could think about choosing another one like Maximizing Our Impact with Carrie Seacrest. Uh, there's the Coordination of Housing and Services Roundtable, Preparing Vermont Communities for a More Inclusive Future, or Washington Insights on Development Costs and Federal Policy. So there's lots of other choices for you. Sorry about that, um, that change in schedule. So with those logistics out of the way, we are very happy to have our state legislators and staff from our congressional delegation here today. I'll start at the federal level. Um, at lunch, we're gonna hear from a video from retiring Senator Patrick Leahy, and you'll be invited to share messages of support with him, which the conference organizers are going to share after today's event. We do have staff registered to be here, and I've seen some of them um, from our congressional delegation. I saw, um, well, Tom Berry is here from Senator Leahy's office. Erhard Manka is here from Senator Sanders' office. Um, Congressman, oh, Senator-elect Welch has staff here today. And our current delegation uh, has to be in DC fighting for what's a very important lame duck session uh, right now. And I know we invited Congresswoman, Congresswoman-elect Becca Ballant to be here today. And uh, she is at new member orientation in DC. So that does feel, these, these excuses do feel kind of, you know, warranted. Um, so a little closer to home, could I have all of our elected legislators, senators, representatives, please stand up so that we know where you are and who you are? So 
They have, they have a special colored uh, indicator on their name tag. Please feel free to uh, go up and accost them and ask them for more money for housing and whatever else comes to your mind. Um, so thank you uh, for being here today, legislators. It shows how important housing is to you and we all look forward to working with you in the session to come. Um, and so we had a great team pulling together uh, the conference today. I wanna recognize the 17 organizations that created today's event. You can see their names here. Um, I'm not gonna read them all, but I do want to appreciate that staff from all these organizations have been working for over nine months to put on this conference. And of course, I want to thank the staff at the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Many and most of our volunteers today are VHFA staff, and they helped prepare for this conference, led by Lori Gilding and Leslie Black Plumo. So I've already mentioned our record turnout and um, what an impressive group it is. And I just wanna make sure we know what we've accomplished since we've last been in this ballroom together. Um, it, it's been tremendous, and yet we know that it's not just about the numbers and what's happened, but it's that magic happened because of the connections that we have and that we're forming. And so you'll notice a change in the agenda today, change from years past, if you are a repeat customer, is that we've doubled the amount of networking time. There's gonna be lots of time in between sessions to get together and connect and, um, and go through uh, work together. And in that spirit, I think I'm going to invite up Carrie Seacrest next to talk a bit about the theme of the conference and what we can expect in those in-between sessions. Thank you. Good morning. And first, on a personal note, I really wanna say thank you to all of you who made such an impact in finding housing for the most vulnerable in our state. As someone who lives in the state in Brattleboro but isn't affiliated with housing, I really understand and know that you worked above and beyond the call of duty these last several years and continue to do so. So from the bottom of my heart, I really, as a regular citizen, wanna say thank you. So today's theme is inspiration to action. And at today's conference, we really hope that you'll be, have sparks of inspiration and new energy, because it can get draining out there on our Zoom boxes. Uh, and so here we are with this collective of energy and people. We hope you'll learn new information to inform your thinking on the topic. We hope that you'll meet a few new people and we also hope that you'll leave with a few concrete actions to take back home. And I'll say it can feel overwhelming sometimes. This isn't a topic that's gonna get solved in a day at the Hilton, uh, especially you know, bumping elbows with our favorite 400 people, most of which whom we don't know. As you saw from that hand raising, there are so many new people here and how amazing that is. Uh, and so the question is, how do we get most out of the day? So the first thing that I want to open with is just to remind us that great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Everyone has their small piece in this world of housing, and collectively, everyone taking meaningful action can have a huge impact. I chose this photo to remind us that we bloom where we're planted. So whatever that means for you, your organization that you're in, the population that you serve, and the, the kind, whether you're at the local, the regional, or the statewide level, it all has an impact. 
The second thing I wanted to share is that the organizers have done an incredible job of creating focus um, for today's uh, session and the, whole, and the whole conference theme. So there's four questions, and you'll see them on your table tents. They're in all of the rooms. They're also in all of the common areas. And the idea is that throughout the day, with these handy dandy beautiful journals, that you um, reflect on those questions and, and kind of walk away with some uh, inspiration, and we'll be going through that. So the first question is, what is inspiring to you today? Are there aha moments, new ways of approaching your work? Is there a person, an organization, something that you want to know more about? What is, what's the inspiring piece? The second question is, what do you want to explore further? Are there strategies, ideas, funding sources, partnerships, like getting all those synapses working together? What's got you there that you, uh, creating some new ways of thinking about things? The third question is about who do you want or need to connect with? Uh, and this is, you've got such an amazing group of people here today. This is an amazing brain trust, if you think about 400, over 450 people registering for this event. And COVID has done a number on personal relationships in the last three years. And there have been a lot of staffing changes in the housing world. And there are a lot of new people here. So, uh, the opportunity is how do we reweave re our roots? And there's this concept I want to share with you called, in our social world, about strong ties and weak ties. So, those people who are in our inner circle, the people who we know well, talk to all the time, those are our strong ties. And we've, we've got that circle of them. And then there's the outer circle of acquaintances and people that we see you know, on occasion that we know to say hi to or we know their name, but we don't see them as much. And those are considered our weak ties. And for new information and ideas, weak ties are more important than strong ones. And how great, because we are at an event where we can create lots and lots of weak ties. So, if you think about it, we've got that small connection through, uh, with, our, with our strong ties. But those people are all swimming in the same information, right? The people you work with every day, your loved ones, your friends, you all are kind of swimming in that same pool. Whereas we need the weak ties to open up and give us friendly opportunities for new information and new ideas. And so from that perspective, uh, the more weak ties we have, the better. They actually say that in some research that those people who have robust, weak networks actually uh, feel happier overall. And if we think about it, um, in COVID, this really got diminished, those small connections with the local barista or the person, you know, your people that you go to yoga with, or the, your neighbors, all of those connections dissipated, but we need them because that enhances our sense of belonging in community. So, my invitation is that uh, during the breaks and the hangouts and at your tables is not to sit with the people that you already know, but really to go out and try to make and meet a few new people. I know for me, there was, uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C., when I was young at 21, I remember totally feeling intimidated by going to networking events. And I used to play a game with myself was I could go home if I had three business cards. And so, <laughs> and so whatever it is your number of the day, I invite you to think whether it's one or three or ten, whatever it is, but at each opportunity to try to reweave and meet new people here today. Uh, there's a lot of change going on. The other thing that I want to invite you to, um, to alert you to is that uh, the organizers put together that list of attendees on purpose. There's two ways you can access it. There are some at the registration table, hard copies, and then it's also on the front page of the conference registration on the, on the website, on the front page. 
And really, you're invited to look through that, identify a few people that you want to meet, and then go look for them. Uh, because, because there's different organizations and how do we re-expand those networks? There is also, if you saw, there are two big boards, two sections, one on the second floor and one on this floor, of uh, all of these four questions. And there's sticky notes, and there's sticky notes right here on all of your tables. If there's someone you want to meet or if there's some information that you want to get or learn about, put it on the take the sticky, put it on those common boards, and the organizers are actually going to try to help connect you. So if you say, hey, I want to meet someone so-and-so, and then check it throughout the day. And if you're a resource and you can offer that, do that. I mean, this is one of those things that it's only going to work if we all play. So I'm going to invite you to play. Um, so that brings us to that question again. Who do you need and want to connect with today? So that you walk out not with I sat next to 400 people, but that I met five people. And here, here they are. And now I can, I can reach out to them after today's conference. So the last question, of course, is what can you do to help solve the housing crisis? And the idea is to think about one takeaway. And it could be something that you're already doing and you want to recommit, because sometimes we're like, yeah, yeah, I do this every day. But with that new energy or new thought on it, how you want to move something forward. And it can be, again, in your work, your personal, or your community life. So if you come out of today saying, I realize I got to go for a walk every day or I'm going to lose it, please do that because we, we, need, we need you not to burn out in this really hard field. So I am always, like, if, if what you walk out of, like, wow, what a great day to be away and I realize I need more time away and I need to take some breaths, that is a completely valid honorable, and I welcome it and invite it um, kind of goal. So for our last few minutes, we've got about five minutes left, and the game we're going to play is called Meet a Neighbor. So what I'm going to invite you to do, if you'd like to stand up, stand up, in case you know, already know everybody at your table. But just introduce yourself, your name, your org, in what way do you uh, support alleviating the housing crisis in Vermont? And why did you say yes today? So stand on up, meet, make eye contact with someone, meet someone. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've already at least checked off one new person you've met. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you at the end of the session. I'm Josh Hanford. I'm the Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. It's such an honor to be here with you today. You know, after a few years off of this conference, it's incredible to be in a packed room with everyone in person. That just uh, warms my heart, so um, thanks for coming. You know, as many of you know, zoning has been a bit of a sleepy policy backwater in Vermont for many years now. This surprises me that um, the rules that shape our communities and Vermont's quality of life were so easily ignored for so long. As we work together to build the housing we need, zoning modernization is a hot topic among policy, state policymakers and local leaders alike. In a recent Vermont Digger story, community life and our connections to each other, about community life and connections to each other, my friend Ben Doyle, who is the president of Preservation Trust of Vermont, said, even just basic zoning, minimum lot size, things like that, maybe aren't designed to be exclusionary, but on a functional level, kind of prevent people from a variety of incomes from getting to know one another. And I'm certainly not a zoning expert, don't pretend to be, but I think he's right. The outdated zoning can create barriers, but good zoning can lead to better neighborhoods and stronger and more inclusive communities. Given Vermont's recent focus on the obstacles and opportunities of zoning, we're lucky to have Sarah Bronin here with us today to share her work on the connections between housing, zoning, 
and how zoning data can better inform policy and advocacy. Sarah Bronin is a Mexican-American architect, attorney, professor, and policymaker who works at the junction of property, land use, historic preservation, and energy. Her work asks the question, how can law and policy foster more equitable, sustainable, well-designed, and connected places? She is a pioneer in making zoning easier to understand through media appearances and extensive publications with great titles like Zoning by a Thousand Cuts. Vermont has so much to learn from her innovative, innovative research, real-world work, including Desegregate Connecticut, an effort to expand housing opportunity in Connecticut by mapping zoning restrictions, promoting transit-oriented communities, advocating for sensible lot sizes for homes, and reducing bureaucracy, which successfully advanced the first major sto statewide zoning reform in several decades. She's now working on a to create a national zoning atlas based on her work in Connecticut. I'm hoping we can talk about that here in Vermont. Sarah's work can help us better understand zoning's relationship to housing affordability, accessibility, and diversity, and offers new hope for improving zoning decisions in the future. She's a professor of the Cornell College of Architecture, Art, and Planning, an associate faculty member of Cornell Law School, as well as a Biden-nominated chair of the U.S. Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. She holds a JD from Yale Law School, Master's of Science from University of Oxford, and Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from the University of Texas. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Bronin for a keynote, Unlocking Zoning Potential to Improve Vermont's Housing Stock. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? Good. You guys are chatty. That's great. Um, that's one thing I've noticed in my short time in this room. Um, so I'm really happy to see everybody get together. Um, thank you, Tamora and Leslie and VHFA for having me here today, and to Commissioner Hanford for that very kind um, introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today uh, about uh, one of the many tools that people in this room have used, uh, and I know that you come from a variety of backgrounds, public sector, private sector, real estate development, um, planning, um, finance, um, and I know that each of you has an interest in uh, leveraging all the tools in your, your, your toolbox um, to promote uh, more equitable and more housing. Um, so today I'm really honing in on this one um, small piece of the puzzle, which is zoning. And the reason is, is zoning, as Commissioner Hanford said, really is the, the they, zoning codes are the rules of the game. And so unless you uh, have good zoning rules, everything else that you're doing uh, in all those other tools in your toolbox might not be able to be used. Um, so with that, all right, great. Uh, with that, I'm going to start with um, what zoning is. And so people, everybody in this room is familiar with zoning, right? Raise your hand if you know what zoning is, OK? Um, so my definition of zoning um, is uh, the local government regulation of land uses, structures, and lots. So sometimes people say, well, zoning is land use regulation, and, and that's true. It does regulate uses, but it's really important for us to keep in mind that it also regulates um, the size and bulk of structures as well as the way that lots are developed. So I see it in, in, in three parts, really. Um, zoning can also regulate specific details of construction. So the images that you're seeing here are images from Hartford, Connecticut, where I was a planning and zoning commissioner for seven years um, and helped to rewrite the zoning code. And these are images of our new code. Um, in the last image, you saw a map because, of course, zoning uh, codes have both a map uh, which designates districts uh, and puts land in, in specific districts, and text. Uh, so you have text like this, this chart uh, that, that looks at our, um, our downtown codes. Um, so where does zoning come from? It comes from um, state zoning enabling acts. Let me see if I can advance this slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
doesn't. It's not advancing quite yet. We're a little behind today, a little sleepy. Um, but zoning comes from state standard zoning enabling acts. And so those uh, have uh, been around for a century. Uh, they were first uh, uh, put out by the US Department of Commerce uh, during the Herbert Hoover era um, and 1920s, mid 1920s. And it's pursuant to those model state zoning enabling acts that zoning was enacted all over the country um, from state legislatures providing local governments with authority to zone. So in a way, zoning is 100 years old um, and lots of communities in Vermont probably adopted zoning in those early stages and then continuing on um, throughout the century. So uh, without slides, I'm gonna just keep going. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm on now. Froze up. I think the projector's frozen. So you're just going to have to 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 imagine uh, that you can see the words that I'm saying, but it doesn't really matter because it's it's all really the same thing. All right. So um, next uh, topic I wanted to talk about was why zoning is important. Um, and so again, lots of you raise your hand. You're familiar with zoning. You know what the consequences of zoning are. And so putting these in, in maybe big buckets, the most obvious consequence of zoning is um, its, uh, its impact on the affordability and the supply of housing. So fair housing, that's what the topic of this conference, one of the reasons you are all here. But of course, along with that comes zoning's consequences on transportation. So if we are regulating our land development through zoning in particular ways, we are regulating land in a way that enables us or prevents us from uh, using cars, uh, using mass transit. If zoning puts, us, uh, puts uh, lots of uses together in dense areas, that it supports transit. If zoning has large minimum lot sizes, that promotes sprawl and car dependency. So zoning has a huge impact on transportation. It also has an impact on how our infrastructure uh, can develop. So not just our, our transportation infrastructure, but water, sewer, um, uh, lighting, uh, energy, uh, zoning and infrastructure interact in really important ways. Um, so, uh, so that may be one bucket, housing and infrastructure. A next bucket um, of ways that zoning impacts our, our lives is in the, in the area of environment. Um, so the way that we zone has huge impacts on environment and uh, on our ability to respond to climate change. Again, thinking about how we zone, if we're zoning in ways that create sprawl, we're requiring people to use cars, we are requiring, uh, essentially requiring greenhouse gas emissions, we're making it harder for people to walk and bike, especially with things like large minimum lot sizes. Zoning also ensures or prevents our ability to access nature. So if we have um, zoning that has things like an urban growth boundary where we develop uh, within the boundary and we have uh, access uh, to nature uh, around us, um, that is a way that we can, um, that, that is, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, again, has consequences. Zoning has impact on our food supply, and of course, uh, I guess the last bucket is the area of opportunity. So economic opportunity, educational opportunity, all of these things are impacted by zoning. If we are zoning uh, single family only, um, residential only neighborhoods without a mix of uses, we're making it harder for people to get back and forth between jobs and, and uh, educational opportunities. Um, so zoning has these really far reaching consequences um, and uh, in, in all of our, the areas of uh, economy and society um, that, that we can probably possibly think of. And I think talking about that and just framing it in that way is really important because otherwise, you know, what's the, wh you know why are we talking about this possibly arcane area of local government uh, law? And it's, in my opinion anyway, it's because we have these uh, really important um, consequences. Okay, so, all right. So we'll flip through all of these. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and now here we are. So, all right, so zoning comes in lots of different forms, and it's the particulars of zoning that 
make these impacts on all of these areas that I've just discussed um, even more uh, salient in some places, more dramatic in, in some places. And so this really brings us to this question, how do we zone now? Um, and how exactly does that particular zoning impact our lives? And I guess I would say um, that given zoning's importance, I've just told you all of the different areas that zoning uh, has an impact, you'd think that we know all the answers to those questions. Um, but the truth is, is that we, we really don't. We don't even really know how we zone today. Um, so you may be familiar with one or two, well, probably lots of you in this room are familiar with lots of zoning codes because that's your area of specialty. But you know, do you, can, can you easily compare jurisdictions to each other? Um, do you know precisely the amount of land that's subject to different zoning rules? And the answer is probably, um, probably not um, because we don't have good tools to do that. Now the reason this question about zoning became really has become really important to me over the last few years. Um, of course, I research in this area. I have um, for the last couple decades, um, I guess. Uh, but the real reason that it became important was through this advocacy effort um, that I helped to found uh, two years ago in Connecticut called Desegregate Connecticut. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that effort and why these questions became particularly important. So Desegregate Connecticut is an ad was an advocacy is an advocacy effort um, based uh, in and obviously Connecticut uh, that really was pushing uh, for statewide reforms uh, and convened in the wake of George Floyd's murder um, to investigate and interrogate how Connecticut's land use laws uh, impact uh, social equity. Um, we expanded our thinking uh, beyond uh, equity and in inclusion to include um, thinking and convening conversations about zoning's impact on uh, prosperity and as well as the environment. So some of these themes that, that we just discussed um, in general. Our team, uh, primarily young people, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, uh, really powered this effort that uh, over its, uh, since June 2020, uh, there's been dozens more uh, students uh, and young people <laughs> who've joined the movement, in addition to our seasoned um, uh, folks at 80 nonprofit um, co coalition members that have joined the coalition. And I'm just going to pause on this slide um, because you can see uh, uh, some of the traditional groups that are involved in planning and architecture, like the AIA, the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association, environmental groups like Save the Sound, the Sierra Club, um, as well as preservation groups. How many preservation, uh, preservationists are represented in this room, preservation organizations? All right. Good job, thank you for being here. I think preservationists are key to the housing conversation, um, and we had all three of our major preservation statewides involved. But one of the ones that I, that I really wanted to point out, because I see that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns is here today, is that one of our coalition members was the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, which was all of the municipalities in the state of Connecticut. And in many other states, the, that organization, or the equivalent, I assume this is the equivalent, um, has not been involved in local uh, zoning and statewide zoning conversations, in part because I think that they fear, well, what, what might happen if the state gets more involved in zoning? And that's what Desegregate Connecticut was advocating for. But we were really fortunate that CCM uh, in our state kind of saw the, that this was the, the way that we zone was hurting our ability to grow as a state and our town's abilities to, to really provide for their individual residents. And so to their credit, um, they got involved and really helped to shape the legislation in a way that worked for towns. Um, and I think I'm hopeful uh, that with the, the presence of the Vermont League here, uh, that they can also continue to be involved in that conversation. Um, so as we emerged and convened all of these, these folks, um, we really just kept getting the same question, which is, Okay, so generally you're talking about zoning. Um, generally you're talking about uh, that it causes these problems. But what about my town? What is my town doing wrong? How does my town compare to other, t other towns? And what exactly uh, does the state as a whole uh, do when it comes to zoning? And the truth is we could not answer that question. So that was the question that kept coming up over and over again. And that's when we decided that it was time for us to really start digging 
into uh, the zoning codes themselves, um, digging into the data and trying to answer that question. Um, so as you know, and here's those Hartford images again, zoning codes include both a map and a text. Um, so what we started to do with our team of, uh, actually that started off with a core team of 10 uh, undergraduates from Yale, they started to gather up all the zoning codes in the state. Um, so it turned out, well, I'll tell you how many in a minute. Um, and we developed a Google Sheet and we just started collecting information about um, the districts, whether they were mapped, whether they were an overlay, what type of district, was it elderly housing, affordable housing, did it permit one, two, three, and four or more family housing? Um, so we, we developed a methodology for that, um, our, our team, and that was very an iterative process. We also started collecting maps. So some maps look like this map from Stanford, uh, Connecticut, a larger city which has uh, a lot of different parts and a lot of different um, codes. I think Stanford's code was one of the longest at 400 pages, Westport's was as well. Um, and some of the maps look like this uh, in the smaller towns, rural areas, where they were digitized but they wouldn't give us the files so we had to digitize them ourselves, or um, they were hand drawn. Um, and these, you, I don't know if you can see, but the one on the right, I mean, you can hardly tell which district is, is which. This is one of the, um, the beach associations that happens to have been given a special authority for zoning from the state legislature. So we were taking these maps and digitizing them, putting them into uh, a coherent statewide GIS file. Um, so this was pretty time consuming. And so we ended up having about uh, 20, 25 different uh, people, including GIS professionals, including staff at, at UConn's um, Center for Land Use Education and Research, um, including students, master students, law students, putting this all together. Um, and it was very ad hoc because it was the first time, to our knowledge, that anybody had ever tried to pull all of these pieces together, the zoning code analysis and the mapping into one coherent um, framework. So we, um, this is uh, an image of Connecticut, um, and this is actually an image of our zoning map, but it, it shows the 169 towns. Um, we actually found that there were 180 zoning jurisdictions because of the legislature's um, special act authority that had been uh, giving, uh, that had, it had given to non-municipal governments. Um, we found that amongst all of that, there were about 2,600 zoning districts and we reviewed in total over 32,000 pages of zoning text. So this is not for the faint of heart, um, but uh, it resulted in the Connecticut Zoning Atlas. So I'm just gonna go through, I, if you, you can look at this online um, at zoningatlas.org and then just click on uh, Connecticut. Um, the Zoning Atlas works like this. First you select what it is you wanna see on the map. So here we've selected one family housing. Um, then the land meeting the criteria shows up in some shade of purple, and the purple shades um, relate, the slight differences in purple relate to whether it's primarily residential, mixed, a mixed zone, or non-residential zone. Um, the atlas can show if a town primarily zones for single-family housing, allows accessory dwelling units or accessory apartments, um, zones for multifamily housing, um, zones for housing are in a one half mile radius around rail uh, stations, or we have a, a Connecticut fast track, a bus rapid transit uh, stations uh, near and around Hartford. Um, and it also shows lot sizes. So these are things that you can toggle on and off in our map. In addition to these, we also collected information about a wide range, about 100 um, characteristics, including setbacks, minimum parking requirements, lot coverage, um, heights, and so on. Um, our findings were pretty, in my view, pretty dramatic. Um, one of the findings was that 91% of land in Connecticut uh, is zoned for single family housing as of right. So that's probably maybe something to be expected in a state that's fairly suburban. 91% um, though is, is pretty large. Um, we also found that only 2% of land in Connecticut allows for four or more family housing as of right. I would bet these numbers are pretty similar in Vermont, um, maybe even more, uh, more so, because we have more, I think, more larger cities, uh, if you consider 100,000 or more large, um, which we do in Connecticut, it's very large. 
<laughs> um, so I'm, I'm from Houston, so I have to give a little, you know, Connecticut is the sa same population as the city of Houston, that, and which has no zoning, but we'll get on that topic maybe another, <laughs> another time. But 91% but versus 2%, and the only way we could have figured that out is by doing that time-consuming mapping process where we were mapping each and every zoning district and highlighting their housing-related characteristics. Um, so just to give you an idea of how this works in New Haven, so New Haven is the kangaroo uh, in the middle there with the two uh, train stations. You'll see what I'm talking about. See it now? Um, that was one family house. This is where one family housing is allowed. This is where two family housing is allowed as of right. And this big block in orange is, I think, elderly housing, two family elderly housing only on existing, uh, in existing structures. So that's a little misleading. Here's where three family housing is allowed, and here's where four or more family housing is allowed. Okay, so what does this map tell you? So if you're familiar with New Haven, you know that New Haven is an urban area. Um, it's a poor city compared to um, its surrounding suburbs. It's also a much less white city uh, when it compared to its surrounding suburbs. Um, and East Haven is, it shares some of those characteristics, and you see that multifamily zoning uh, there as well. Um, work that I'm doing right now with Urban Institute confirms uh, what we probably could have uh, figured out without any of this mapping, which is that multifamily zoning is really corresponding with lower income, um, a higher percentage of minority areas. So, but, but if you look at this map, um, and then you wonder, if you've ever wondered, why is New Haven uh, more affordable? Why is New Haven the place where um, uh, lower income people uh, tend to gather in the region? It's because there's no way for them to find housing in uh, other areas uh, when much of the surrounding area has large minimum lot sizes and is single family only. Those two characteristics probably alone contribute to the cost of housing in the area. So as I said, uh, we logged many different characteristics when it came to housing. Um, so we have accessory apartments, uh, and we have logged lots of different features related to their per, uh, being permitted. Uh, we logged whether public hearings were required. So when I say as of right, that means without a public hearing. That means an administrative approval. I know that these two issues, accessory housing and public hearings, um, and minimum lot size uh, are things you've been talking about in Vermont and that Act 179 from 2020 address the accessory apartments and minimum lot size to some extent. So you're probably familiar with what minimum lot size uh, is. We log those numbers, um, the specific number of uh, uh, acres required per lot. Um, density, uh, minimum unit area, so how big apartments have to be. Um, we found that Darien, Connecticut, for example, required apartments to be 2,000 square feet. Um, we also found Darien required three parking spaces for a studio apartment. Um, three, just in case you needed more parking for your three cars than your studio apartment uh, square footage. Um, so minimum parking requirements. Um, we also looked specifically at uh, affordable housing uh, provisions within zoning codes, um, the maximum number of bedrooms that were permitted. So many towns had, uh, you could build apartments, but they can only be one bedroom. Uh, they could only be uh, two bedrooms. Um, or you could build apartments, but they can only be six units total. So the, there are caps on number of bedrooms and caps on number of units in apartment buildings. So these are the things that we logged um, across, again, all of these different, uh, different towns. Um, and um, there's a lot to unpack in all of that. And today I'm just gonna focus on two areas. A and these two areas, again, are areas that you've covered, at least in part, through statewide legislation here in Vermont, started to open the door. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you some stats here and some strategies that we use in Connecticut um, just to, to kind of uh, let you know what we, um, what we were doing there. So accessory apartments, accessory dwelling units, these are small independent units uh, that are built in the same lot as the larger units. So what did the zoning atlas tell us when it came to accessory apartments? Um, if you just click on the zoning atlas and you say, where are ADUs allowed? It looks like they're allowed in a lot of the state. Good job, Connecticut. Pat yourself on the back, even without statewide ADU legislation. Look at how many ADUs are permitted. 
Except when you get down to um, the details, and this is what you're bringing up that topic, zoning by a thousand cuts. This is where these little other requirements that unless you log them, you don't really understand whether these types of housing, uh, these, these types of different types of housing are permitted, including ADUs. So if you're looking for an ADU that allows for non-owner occupancy, that allows for people who are not family members or employees, that allows renters, because there are prohibitions on renting in some codes, uh, and that are not restricted to elderly only, this is what you get. So this is a different chart than this, which looks, oh great, good job. But uh, if you're really thinking about an ADU that might be available on the open market for rent, this is what you, what you see instead. Um, and then here, um, if you add to that, um, uh, these two physical requirements that there's no maximum size, um, so there's a, often a cap, a physical, a number of square foot cap on ADUs, um, or it's not restricted to the primary structure. So in other words, um, it, it can be detached, so let's say over a garage or in a, a, a detached unit, um, you get essentially nowhere. So where could you build a detached unit that's not subject to occupancy requirements, that doesn't have a maximum size limitation? Um, Nowhere. <laughs> so, or very few places. You can actually build that in Hartford. Um, uh, but so we really started to advocate for this and, and the law that we passed, uh, the legislature passed last year, addressed this issue in part um, and addressed a lot of those little uh, provisions uh, like the maximum size, number of parking requirements, uh, number of parking spaces required, capping that at one and so on. Um, so we produced a couple of videos. I encourage you to go to desegregatect.org, which is uh, the site where you can watch these videos and I think they're pretty, pretty cool. But in terms of advocacy, what we tried to do was we paired the data that we had with uh, these more, I guess, um, uh, video type and social media type advocacy tools. The second topic I wanted to talk about was minimum lot sizes. So again, you're probably well familiar with this. Zoning codes can dictate how big a lot has to be for a unit of housing to be built. Um, the larger the lot, the fewer homes it can be built. What you're seeing here is actually pretty small minimum lot sizes with shared space in the middle. Um, crazy finding, in my opinion, of the Connecticut Zoning Atlas, again, using that data, 81% of residential land in the state requires essentially a one acre minimum. How big is an acre? It's big, right? I'm sure lots of, lots of you who live out in rural areas, you know, can, the acre is not uncommon. But this went for our suburbs too. This went for areas in cities, look at Stamford, half of Stamford, Connecticut is uh, over one acre, uh, one acre or more zoning. Um, if you look at Greenwich, which is the community closest to New York City, uh, it's four acre zoning, as is, um, as are uh, New Canaan and, and Darien and some of these other towns, close to New York City. Even more shocking, half of the land requires, and you can see Greenwich is still purple, half, half of it's purple there, uh, requires two acres per single family home. So what does that do to home prices? But more importantly, or just as importantly, what does it do to sprawl and our, our ability to build um, compact developments that people actually wanna live in? Not everybody wants to live in this kind of housing. So again, here we use the data, we issued a, a maybe 30, 40 page issue brief, specifically on minimum lot sizes. We did reports, uh, videos, we assembled graphics that uh, we hoped would show people lots of different options for uh, how you can get in the case of the bottom right, 15 units on one acre of land <laughs> as opposed to one. Um, and so again, you know, feel free to check out this paper. It's on the Social Science Research Network. It's a free download and it uh, will be published soon. Um, okay. There's lots of other information in the zone, that the zoning atlas can convey. One piece of information, um, minimum parking requirements, which I'm happy to talk more about in the Q&A, uh, we should just completely abolish um, parking requirements uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, that's a, that's a no-brainer. The whole state should do it. Actually, Connecticut, um, 
did cap uh, in its legislation minimum parking requirements, although individual towns can opt out of that. Um, any, but anyway, so that was bad, but at least we started. Um, and lots of towns or cities across the country are eliminating them. But this image shows you that if all of these other zoning provisions remain the same, how much housing could be built within three of the 15 walkable cities that we studied, this is Bridgeport, Norwalk and Waterbury, what we saw in this data, and it's, you don't necessarily know these cities, but you can probably tell that there are these white lines that are corridors, main streets, um, so historic main, the historic main streets of these towns, um, and a lot of the housing that it could be built, so the darker purple means lost opportunity. The darker the purple, the bigger the lost opportunity. A lot of the housing that would be built if it were not for minimum parking requirements is housing along those historic corridors. So if you think about what minimum parking requirements do to our historic, our small towns, they basically prevent those buildings that are already there from being reused because to change their use, that triggers zoning compliance, it triggers parking requirements, but it also promotes demolition and it also shrinks the amount of building that can be built, which shrinks the amount of housing that can be built um, if we're focused here on housing. Um, but really, this parking requirements go for, you know, of course, go for a mix of, uh, of uses. I encourage you to check out the issue briefs that Desegregate Connecticut uh, wrote, uh, the environmental case for zoning reform, transit-oriented communities, uh, economic case for it, as well as our playbooks um, that we made for land use board candidates, commissioners, and just general advocates. How do you talk about zoning? What are the things that you ask for? What are the strategies that you can use? Um, feel free to plagiarize the language and modify it for Connecticut. I'm happy to give anybody those files. Um, okay, so. With that in mind, so that was our Connecticut uh, approach. We really based our advocacy in this data because people were asking us these really good questions about what Connecticut actually uh, was doing and how we were actually zoning. And now people can go to that zoning atlas and they can click on their town and get all the stats for their town that pops up uh, right on the atlas. So I was asked to just uh, say a few things about what Vermont can do. Um, of course, you're already doing a lot of stuff statewide. You're convening, you're here, you're talking today with each other. Um, and I know you'll have some great plans uh, for this really great conference uh, as the day uh, unfolds. Um, but I wanted to talk uh, to you, make a pitch for Vermont to uh, join the National Zoning Atlas effort so that you can get some of these advantages of both collaboration with other researchers, but also just the data itself. Um, so we launched the National Zoning Atlas in May um, using the Connecticut Zoning Atlas as the example and hoping that other states would use uh, the, our methodology and, and join in. And to our surprise, 13 other states have already launched their zoning atlases. Um, and we are working with all of them, convening them through my lab at Cornell uh, to uh, develop their atlases. I'm just gonna point out, I'm not putting any pressure on you here. I'll just let this, let this image speak for itself. I'll say too that we have teams in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland forming. So that's gonna look like a sea of blue um, and uh, Vermont's not there yet. Um, the goal of the National Zoning Atlas is to translate and standardize all of this zoning information in hundreds of really indecipherable to the common person pages uh, across these jurisdictions into a standard zoning interface where people, ordinary people, advocates, policymakers, elected officials, I love that elected officials are in this room, um, can use the information and the chips are gonna fall where they may. You know, th there's no manipulation of this zoning data. You're just gonna see what's out there. Um, and um, you know, you can, you, whoever wants to use it can, can start to use it, developers. Um, all of these states are using this guide uh, that we wrote called How to Make a Zoning Atlas. It's also a free download um, if you want to check it out. It's just been updated. We update it every month um, almost uh, to address questions that arise in different places. So some states, for example, have extraterritorial jurisdiction. Some states have um, different zoning procedures. Uh, so we include all of those scenarios in our updated guides. Again, we, with the uh, map and the text, the biggest requirement is collecting that information that is sometimes harder than it 
um, needs to be. So not every jurisdiction wants to just hand you their zoning codes, even though it's a public document. They, sometimes they make you go to their office and physically photograph or Xerox a copy of the zoning code. Um, the methodology requires that all of these types of uh, um, uh, features of a zoning code be logged, so the type of zoning district, you saw some of these in that initial screenshot, um, different characteristics about accessory dwellings, planned residential developments. Um, so here you see, again, my own definition of zoning is uses, lots, and structures, and so that's how this guide is organized. Um, under lots, we have lot size, density, setbacks, lot coverage, parking, connectivity requirements. You probably don't have so much of that here, but we have um, uh, things like uh, uh, housing can only be, be built if it's near public transit stop or uh, connected to water or sewer. Um, actually, you do have that here actually in your in your state law, but um, but we have some of that in Connecticut and some other places do too. Um, and then structures, um, floor to area ratio, maximum bedroom, maximum unit, and so on. So different states are taking different approaches. My lab is running the New York Zoning Atlas with uh, lots of different project partners. There's one of my students, he was a project manager um, doing a presentation. Uh, Montana is, uh, so our, our project partners are our universities, a state agency, um, and uh, nonprofits like the Regional Plan Association. Uh, Montana is another example of, of uh, they, they've started to, um, uh, they're almost done collecting their data. And that's being done by, uh, entirely by a nonprofit organization called the Frontier Institute, a libertarian leaning um, institute. Um, so there's a big tent here in terms of ideologies, why people are collecting this information. Um, some people might say, well, this is good for deregulation and the market. Other people might uh, have that social justice uh, angle. So going back to uh, you know, all of these motivations, is, are you motivated by fair housing? Are you motivated by climate? Are you motivated by opportunity? The zoning data can be overlain on other ge geospatial data that, that can really tell us not only just those questions about where people live, uh, but also climate threats, sea level rise. Um, why are we putting apartment buildings in places that are vulnerable for sea level rise, um, and and so on? So, will Vermont join the National Zoning Atlas? I hope so. If you do, you have, I think, almost 300 local governments. If you use the Connecticut numbers, that means there's a, about 4,000 zoning districts and maybe 50,000 pages of zoning text. However, I bet a lot of your communities don't have zoning. So in Connecticut, we, so you know, your work might actually be pretty light, uh, depending, uh, depending on how many of those towns actually have zoning. In Connecticut, we basically have universal zoning because it is so urbanized and um, it's sort of sandwiched between uh, New York and Boston, and so I guess, I don't know, really popular there, but I bet you don't have as much work, uh, work to do here. Um, if you are interested, there's a page on the Zoning Atlas website that's called Want to Make Your Own Atlas, <laughs> and there you can find information about assembling a team, links to the how-to guide, um, and kind of our approach uh, for as, as in terms of our collaborative. Um, we do have uh, four staff members uh, existing and incoming uh, in our National Zoning Atlas, uh, I guess, headquarters in our lab. Um, that common how-to guide, which is 100 pages, so it's extremely detailed how you're supposed to um, collect uh, that information, and a community of researchers and collaborators. So here are, again, you see universities, nonprofit organizations, organizations, um, metropolitan planning authorities like the Chicago uh, Planning Authority um, and, the, and the MAPC in Massachusetts, um, as well as uh, funders uh, from uh, different uh, capacities. So uh, please feel free to be in touch with me. I'm going to open for Q&A. There's my Twitter handle. Um, if anybody's on Twitter, I'm always happy to connect. Um, and I think I'll just stop there. Is that good? Yep. All right, so I think you're supposed to use the microphones. That was the one thing that I was supposed to say. So there's one here, and then there's one here. Oh. Is that on? <laughs> okay, here's my question. So who in this room do we have to convince, like all of these people, to get us to join the Zoning <laughs> Atlas? Thanks. 
Oh, gosh. I mean, it just takes one person. So, you know, we found um, there's a, a team emerging in Virginia, and it's basically a grad student who said, I'm going to have to, I want to do this. So he contacted the APA, local or local universities, professors, asking people to take specific regions. He's just sort of taking it on himself. I mean, it really, I mean, there's lots of different ways project teams can can emerge. It could come from one of the state agencies. Um, it could come from, you know, legislative uh, authority. It could come from uh, a few regional planning authorities uh, banding together. So there's uh, it, lots of different ways. Um, we the way that we've been taking on project teams is, um, you know, essentially just talking with them, seeing if they have a credible team, and then connecting them with funding resources. So if you don't necessarily have funding resources here, um, you know, we can probably help find some so at least some startup funding. Yeah. Uh, is zoning strictly a state rights issue? Um, does the federal government have any role in this, or do the, does the federal government have plans, possibly in the future, to address the inequalities by the zoning issues um, as a as a federal issue? Yeah, so you might have seen a few months ago, President Biden released an executive order indicating that um, that the administration aspired to connect um, uh, uh, certain housing uh, or certain federal programs with zoning progress. Um, and so after announcing that, um, I think maybe they realized, well, we don't have a baseline for how communities zone now, so how are we going to know whether they've made progress? And so we've been talking a bit with the White House and with HUD about how the National Zoning Atlas can be used um, to help them at least establish a baseline now and see what aspects of uh, zoning might be important to incentivize. So, you know, for example, if it's minimum lot size that's driving housing supply and affordability issue, which it, it probably is in our research, will uh, can probably show that, um, then you focus maybe on reducing the amount of large lot uh, zoning in a community. Um, so what is that differential and how will the administration reward that? Um, beyond that, uh, incentive uh, type arrangements, I don't think that uh, the federal government has any specific plans, although there's definitely some um, discussion in the Senate um, and it, particularly in the Senate about uh, the federal government's role in zoning because of its impacts on interstate commerce. Um, so there, at least there is a, a, some kind of hook there. Um, but for now uh, and for the last century, it's really been states that are um, in charge of enabling and, and making the rules. Is this it? Yay, we've got mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Uh, so I'm wondering um, how uh, the state and the legislature dealt with um, cooperation or pushback from the local towns who have had zoning in place for a long time. And how did you deal with red line districts, so-called red line districts, which I would imagine Connecticut has quite a few of? Well, you know, redlining really refers to, at least in my um, uh, my experience that, that historical uh, uh, bank, more of a bank policy um, uh, type uh, uh, districting as opposed to zoning, which is land use regulation. So um, I think we can probably, um, and in fact, some have started to overlay those historical redlining maps with uh, current zoning, finding that the areas that were zoned, you know, C and D, sort of lower quality neighborhoods, tend to be those neighborhoods that still have um, uh, lower income demographic characteristics, but also are zoned for multifamily housing. So I think there's a correlation there. Um, your first question about resistance. Um, so I actually think that with knowledge about what zoning is and does, uh, people get very interested in, in changing it. And certainly there's a knee-jerk reaction out there um, by, uh, by individual people, by lo some local elected officials that might say, well, it's always been this way, we don't want to change it, and I think that status quo bias affects policymaking across lots of different spheres. Um, the opportunity we have, and, and you reference that, housing is having a moment uh, this morning. Um, the opportunity that we have right now is that people are taking more of an interest. Um, and so, although we saw some pushback um, from especially towns down on in the Fairfield County, close to New York City area. We actually saw elected uh, officials from small towns uh, and uh, big towns 
um, New Haven, Hartford, uh, uh, Pomfret, small town, um, it testify at that hearing for the bill that, that eventually passed in favor of the legislation. Because again, I think the, the, as people gain more understanding about what zoning is, they realize that what their neighbors do, what they do, it's sort of all related. And so to have guidance that presents a more uh, unified approach to uh, land use regulation across jurisdictions actually can help some of these towns um, uh, achieve their population goals, population growth goals uh, in a slow growth state. Um, so I, yeah, there's definitely always gonna be resistance, but I think part of what we were trying to do through Desegregate Connecticut is arm ordinary people with information about their own zoning so that they could go to their elected officials and try, start to turn that tide away from just the status quo bias. Is there a type of current use in Connecticut for your rural areas, current use program? Um, or use value program, I should say. Uh, not the way that, I, maybe not the way that Vermont does it, no. Yeah, we don't have an Act 250. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Ariel Jensen Vargas. Um, one of the things that you mentioned very briefly is something just that I would kind of bring into a focus is um, the ADUs allowing for farm workers to live on the property. Um, there is a significant population of Mexican farm workers in Vermont, um, and those people are actually living on the property of the farmer. Some of those Mexican farm workers do not, are not actually legally here in this country. So this kind of emphasizes the fact that these are people that are, not, that are living at their, on their employer's land, giving that landowner a lot of power. When we're talking about Connecticut, we're talking about the fact that with such a scarcity of rental housing, that means that if you lose your rental housing, the, um, the ability to find another rental in a maybe 30 day block of time is so difficult that that actually adds to the disparity of power between the landlord and the tenant. And that's just something that I would like to em emphasize is that these zoning laws are really impacting the tenants as well in terms of having no power to control their lives. I, yes, and I think that's a, that's a great point. So in, it, it, across the country, we have a housing shortage. We don't have enough housing um, for people. And what that means is that, in, especially in the renters context, um, we see that landlords have much more power because renters can't move. They don't have that ability to exit, um, as we uh, you know, talk sometimes in, in um, the economics literature. They, 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 can't, they can't move. Um, and even when they uh, would like to, um, the housing that they want to find is more expensive. If we created more housing, tenants would have more opportunities uh, to do that. Um, the issue of the uh, farm worker housing is interesting. Um, we don't have good data on that because what that is, so in one way you could th you could consider it, well maybe this is multifamily housing because you have multi, multi unrelated people living on the same lot, but it's not really, you know, kind of skew the, the numbers to count that sort of temporary work dependent housing as um, multifamily housing equivalent to say an apartment building in Burlington. Um, so one thing that states have been doing is where you have those con specific conditions. So if, if there's lots of um, farm worker type housing here, there's you create a new column or you collect that data for Vermont, uh, even if it's not collected in, in a Connecticut. Um, so that's uh, definitely an option. Thanks. thanks. Hi, thank you very much. Um, one thing that I've been very curious about for a long time my observations, uh, which I'm sure you've seen plenty of times, uh, the wealthier communities declining to have, <clears throat> to accommodate uh, housing for lower income people. So I've always thought that it might be appropriate for the state to say every community needs to zone for housing to accommodate their share of the state's entire population. Um, <clears throat> just to make it fair, just to say across the entire state, okay, every rich town has to be, be ready to uh, provide housing for a low-income component of the entire state. What do yeah, you think so, 
So what you're talking about is fair share legislation. Um, so New Jersey is a state that has a fair share regime um, as a result of court cases, the Mount Laurel decision, that have in turn resulted in sta a state agency being created um, and housing being constructed that enables municipalities across New Jersey to bear uh, more of what is their fair share uh, than they have in the past. Um, that has resulted in housing uh, being created in New Jersey, but in some ways it has um, resulted in housing that's not necessarily in the right places. So for a state like uh, Connecticut, where you have a lot of um, rural areas and suburban areas, um, my bias is, and this is just my bias, my bias is that what we should be doing is building um, uh, new housing in places where we have existing infrastructure, not dispersing housing out to places where people can't, even if they do have uh, an inexpensive apartment, they can't access the services that they need. So our thought through Desegregate Connecticut is that instead of focusing on the fair share model, which was developed in the 1970s and 80s um, of thinking, is that we should focus on areas that already have water and sewer, um, which is not all of Connecticut, um, but also areas around transit stations. Um, so we have uh, 61 transit stations, 61, 62, if you count up the rail and the Connecticut fast track stations. And simply by rezoning those to allow for 15 units per acre could, could create hundreds of thousands of, of new housing units, as long as that, uh, the, that housing is permitted as of right. So the, the, I, I, I haven't emphasized enough um, the, the power of public hearings to kill housing. Um, because people who show up at public hearings are the people who already live in a town. They're not people who don't yet live in that town, but want to live in that town. And even when those people show up at hearings, they're shouted down or things get, I'm sure not in Vermont, but in some places, um, people are not very polite. Um, so I, the, the reason, I think Vermont has a lot of respect for planning and but the planning has to translate into regulations that enable those plans to be developed. And once you've planned, and once you've changed the regulations to develop that kind of housing in the way that you've planned for, there really should not be a need for additional public hearings for individual housing applications. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great. So eliminate public hearings for housing. Um, as long as you write the rules, so in Hartford, for example, we have a form-based code. Um, every We know exactly what's going to be built. We know how tall it's going to be. We know where it's going to be situated with respect to the street line. Um, we know even what kind of roof it's going to be. Maybe that's too prescriptive, but Hartford is very historic, lots of historic neighborhoods, so we wanted to kind of provide some parameters. There are no public hearings in the city of Hartford for any housing. Um, and that's just, that's how we wanted it. And there's no, there's no parking requirements either. There's a uh, bike parking requirement that's like lawless over there. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's how we wrote, wrote the rules um, intentionally because again, in a slow growth state, in a struggling city, what we want is development that fits, is compatible with, with our neighborhoods, uh, but also is easy to build. So if you're frustrated here in Vermont, you're a real estate developer, come to Hartford. Um, I'll put that little plug in here too. My husband would be, uh, would be, uh, who's the mayor of Hartford, would be uh, mad at me if I didn't put that plug in. All right, I think this is the last question. Hi, um, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, that was a really cool talk. Um, I'm a computer science student at uh, the University of Vermont, so I'm really uh, super interested in what you had to say. Um, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a big hole in the middle of Burlington. Um, we call it the pit, um, and it's, uh, uh, one of the problems that kind of created the pit was like a reliance on private development um, and a lack of community control and equity in development. And I'm just curious um, how you think of uh, zoning, balancing, encouragement of private development while also considering equity um, and community control. So I think the, the, the best path to equity is kind of what I was just saying, is that if, if you have parameters within which private development can occur, and you make it so that people can't block, especially housing, I'm really talking about housing, um, then you will be, it'll be much faster for a community to create housing and create opportunities. Um, I'm not familiar with, with the pit, um, but I'll have to check it out <laughs> sometime today. Um, 
so I, I mean, I think, so for me, I mean, I've worked in real estate development. I obviously care about equity too, um, as you can see through Desegregate Connecticut. I think there is a way to balance. I mean, just the way, I mean, I've written about in other areas, there is a way to balance historic preservation and affordable housing and historic preservation and renewable energy. To me, these are design problems. In the case of zoning, it's a legal design problem. In the case of um, historic preservation and ADA compliance, that's an architectural design problem. These are design problems. Um, and if you design the system with that goal, equity in mind, and you say, um, you know, we're going to approve uh, in this town uh, apartment buildings with X percent affordable units, just as of right, we're just going to do that. Um, you know, that that may even be a start of it. I do want to say one more thing, since you're a computer science uh, major, one of the things that we are hoping to do uh, with this National Zoning Atlas project is use machine learning um, to. Uh, more quickly read zoning codes and code them. Um, and if we're able to uh, get some funding for that, um, we have a grant into the National Science Foundation, um, we will but, you know, be one of the first projects that um, has these really complicated 200-page legal texts where a machine can go through them and actually um, spit out at least a good chunk of information that we might be able to use for the zoning atlas. So don't wait too long, Vermont, um, but if you, <laughs> you might benefit from some of that research um, and accelerate, uh, accelerate your work. But I think that's going to be a very cool new frontier in computer science um, and at the intersection of computer science and law. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.